talking. I'll just give you an overview of the talk. First, I'll introduce my organization, then I'll follow it up with the current state uh, in terms of the mega trends and, and the long-term outlook for the industry, followed by, uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, followed by the European chemicals and plastics industry, where it stands as of now, the risk opportunities and options which the industry could take, and the technology pathways which are on the table uh, and getting debated and of course developed as we go. Lastly, I will cover the 2030 scenario for the Netherlands and also cover a European context in terms of an academic view on, on how things are emerging in the industry. So TNO is a research and technology organization in the Netherlands. We connect people and knowledge to create innovations that really contribute to the contrib competitive strength of the industry and well-being of the society in total. We were established in 1932 by law in the Netherlands and have an annual turnover of more than 500 million euros. The important thing to note here is we have 2,900 plus scientists and experts working on different sectors to contribute towards the Dutch uh, industry and various sectors. TNO's vision in terms of circular economy is to have a sustainable and circular economy where materials are reused and also recycled to at, at, at the fullest. And our strategy is, I'll not go into the details, but our strategy is to have a development of disruptive technologies. My colleague Rinke will also touch upon those aspects later on do, during the day. If you look at the core issues which we have, can we make this as a full uh, screen uh, presentation mode? The core issues which we have is the climate change is probably one of the biggest societal challenge which we face as of now to the as, as, as human beings. There is, of course, uh, the circularity challenge. The world at present is probably 8.6% circular, roughly nine uh, if some people claim about it. But the outlook is not that bleak. The global net ambitions coverage for making the uh, climate change targets is already made a coverage of 90% GDP in terms of ambitions from various nations, companies, to actually achieve the climate uh, objectives. And the climate and circular economy is also high on the agenda for governments and, and industry as a whole. The Paris Climate uh, Agreement is in place now. The European Plastics Pact is also in place, which has long-term targets, followed by the plastics uh, NL uh, objectives as well for 2025. There are various forces which are driving circular economy, especially in the chemical industry, if right from the climate risk I mentioned, towards the societal pressure, there is increased awareness and demand from the consumers as well as the brand owners. That is really pushing the industry to move towards the circular economy. Investors are asking for high ESG scores now, and also shareholder activism is to the highest level, which have not been seen in the recent past. Competition, Various companies are already looking into differentiating uh, themselves and branding uh, on circular economy as also on, on uh, society and also on sustainability. There are also increased geopolitical risks which have uh, emerged recently. And there is of course regulatory pressure from uh, on the industry to move towards circular economy. Recently, technology developments and deployment has also contributed towards moving towards the circular economy solutions for the, for the industry which is a positive sign. The 2002-2050 outlook, this chart was discussed by Carlos as well. McKenzie gives an outlook of 1% CAGR for virgin plastic feedstock uh, growth by 2050. But for the recycled solutions, the growth is anywhere between 7% all the way to 18% CAGR. That's quite high compared to the virgin one. NOAA institutes give another story of where you have bio-based feedstocks also coming in the mix together with the recycled solutions. Two different assessments, but the analysis is similar narrative. Momentum shift towards circular economy and decarbonization for the industry. That is happening. And the long-term trend which the industry has faced, especially the European plastics industry, both in terms of chemical sales and in terms of plastic production, the European plastics and chemicals uh, production and sales have declined over the recent past. 
and it, the production has actually shifted to Asia and, and Middle East. And there is a shift which will continue to happen, and now that's where the question is, industry really need to differentiate. Further insights on the industry, for the European plastics industry, if you look at the ethylene cash cost curve, Europe is on the right side of the cash cost curve, which means we are really expensive in Europe in terms of production for plastics and uh, petrochemicals. The left side of the cost curves are North America and Middle East. The European crackers really uh, are threatened by cheaper imports on the virgin side. At the same time, there is circular economy pull. So the industry is getting sandwiched between these forces. And that's where there is a need for the industry to differentiate it, itself on how do you actually protect yourself from, from these external dynamics which is happening. On top of it, uh, the complex customer and sectoral mix, which the in chemical industry has, really puts where challenges for the industry to the next level, where it's extremely hard to provide niche circularity solutions at a product level or at every customer segment level. And the complex supply chains per customer segment leads to further challenges in establishing cost-effective circular solutions. So therefore, platform-based approach is better suited for the industry to shift towards circular economy rather than small tweaks in terms of process imp improvements or small tweaks in terms of product development. The same story goes for packaging uh, as well. Uh, for plastics production, it's extremely hard to provide niche circularity solutions to every product because of high product development cost and the benefit you could realize from the segment or sector-based approach to deliver accelerated results, which is really the need of the hour here. And if you also look at, for an example, for packaging, most, it is mostly dominated by polyolefins, polystyrene, and PET. And if you have a platform-based uh, rules or a product category rules defined per segment type, you could weed out the, weed out the tail here and actually increase the recyclability and circular economy solutions offered per segment uh, type here. So the segment-based approach or segment-based circular value chains are better suited in terms of cost efficiency rather than in individual product developments. If I sum up the entire story in terms of risk and opportunities for the circular economy, uh, the list is long, but few things stand out. Many technologies are under development, and because of the long technology development types, these time, there is a significant risk for the industry to catch up on the circular economy. And which are the winning technologies? It has still not emerged. And that's, that's a big risk for the industry. Culturally, there has been lack of awareness, willingness, or the agility by the petrochemicals or the plastics industry to engage with circular economy solutions. And I will show you uh, in my slides later on, why do I say so? But there is definitely an opportunity for the industry to demonstrate leadership here. Industry players who are really active in this space are already gaining traction in terms of branding and also showing leadership there. Uh, and of course, gaining customers as well. Broadly, on circular economy, there are four main pathways, mechanical purification, depolymerization, and feedstock recycling. And, and depolymerization and feedstock recycling is also called as circular uh, chemical recycling here. Some of the solutions are already available at uh, pilot scale, commercial, and demonstration scale. And as, as an example for pyrolysis, you already have certain players active in the market, especially in Europe, and uh, US is also catching up quite fast. Plastics Energy, you already heard the talk. <laughs> Uh, who are very active in developing pyrolysis technology, putting it in terms of demonstration scale at present, and then big players are already getting active in getting tie-ups with the pyrolysis manufacturers to close the uh, loop at the cracker level. The loop has not been closed before the cracker level, and that's also something could emerge with the new technologies which are presently in the lab scale. And that would be definitely a game changer for the paralysis value chain at the back. Last year, we did a scenario for, for the Netherlands 
on what would be the 2030 outlook or a theoretical scenario when there is no import of waste plastic feedstock for plastic flows in the Netherlands. It was more of an academic exercise which we did to understand where is the opportunity which lies for, for the industry. What we see is there is significant opportunity for mechanical recycling to actually scale up. The current capacity is in the range of 250 to 300 kilotons. It could go at the range of 100,000, uh, 1,000 kilotons. At the same time, paralysis and gasification would also likely emerge at, at a considerable scale, which is definitely advantageous for the industry. The Dutch chemical in the plastics consumption theoretically could be made circular if all the parameters are lining up well theoretically, but there will still be a challenge that the industry will not be circular. The reason is Netherlands is a big exporter of, of plastic products uh, and downstream chemicals. And that's where the challenge lies. How do you actually make that Dutch plastics industry circular on top of the plastics consumption. These are two different goals, and this will con and it will be extremely hard to actually meet these goals even for 2050 scenario. Now, the opportunity size uh, for the various te recycling technologies were also done. We kind of did, especially for this 2050, uh, 2030 scenario, no imports for waste plastic feedstock. And in this scenario, we also found out that incineration will not be weeded out by 2030. It, won't, it will still have some role to play in the previous slide I, I explained. Deep word, summary of this present uh, slide is dissolution will not likely be a mass market solution. So betting on dissolution to be a 500 kiloton capacity, definitely you are at risk if you are an industry player. Depolymerization for PET definitely has an opportunity there but it could do up to a certain extent because of two reasons, product technology combination, and of course the type of input stream in terms of PET volumes, which you, which you could get in, in the industry as we as feedstock. Pyrolysis and gasification, of course, is a, a significant opportunity here, and it will compete at the same scale, likely with mechanical recycling. And both these technologies are, of course, complementary in nature. In total, a cascaded approach will emerge or should emerge because if you have pyrosis lined up competing with mechanical recycling, that's not a good outcome for the industry in terms of specifications. Ideally, the waste streams which cannot be re recycled in mechanical recycling should go to pyrosis and gasification. That's the best scenario for the cascaded approach I, sh I showed there. If you extend the analysis to the European context, Europe converted demand is roughly 49 million metric tons. The post-consumer waste in the Netherlands, in, in Europe is 29 million metric tons, which is considerably lower. It has to really go up. The recycled production capacity for recycled plastics is 5 million tons. And of course, the plant capacity announced by the industry for chemical recycling is 1.2 million tons for, by 2025 and 3.4 by 2030. This was the number which Carlos also mentioned, 7 billion investment by the chemical industry in terms of chemical recycling capacity by 2030, which is nice, of course positive, but you still have a gap here. And that's a gap I would like to highlight here, that this really puts the market in the short and medium term until 2025, 26 into a tight position where the recycled feedstock will be high in demand, recycled plastic, but there will not be sufficient sup supply coming up. Un because these capacities which have been planned are not going to come up next day. They're likely going to come up by 2025 or 2030. And that's the, that's the risk which we, we have in terms, of, in terms of demand supply mismatch here. One important aspect also to note here is there is a risk of XX percent idle virgin plastic capacity or cracker production capacity for Europe by the year 2030. I'll not mention this excess number because this is this could be debatable, but point to be well noted. If you want to have a conversation, we can of course have that on what this number would likely be. Poland seems to be an interesting case where waste plastic feedstock 
could be actually exported to the neighboring regions such as Germany or, or, or other regions. Now, in summary, I would just like to highlight this point. It is not always the strongest or the most intelligent species that survive, the one which is responsible to change, and whether the petrochemicals and the plastics industry of Europe would be responsible, responsive to change is to be seen out now. Thank you for listening, and I'm open for questions.